you to learn how to use this fabulous equipment because then you can go out and show everybody else how to do it. You can have contact with graduate students, all right, well. So this is one that actually is often complained about. I often see comments that, ah, oh, yeah, I sent, I'm spending $20,000 a year to send my kid to school, and all they do is get taught by graduate students, and I find that very offensive. I taught when I was a graduate student, and I was damn good, okay? I put a lot of work into it, and your graduate students do too. Having access to graduate students is actually extremely important for them. They're gonna go out and teach people at other places, and obviously when we send our graduate students off to places like Michigan or Washington or even over to Austin, we wanna show that Texas A&M trains fabulous academic scientists, and being able to teach and having that experience as a graduate student is very important for that. But they also benefit from interactions with you. You're part of teaching those graduate students how to, turn, how to become scientists. You can take graduate courses if you want. I'm glad this was on the list because I think it's important for you to realize that in the honors program, you're gonna need a capstone experience. You can, uh, for that capstone experience, do uh, capstone courses in various departments, and you're also going to have the opportunity to take graduate courses for honors credit, right? So if you're looking for that extra few hours, you can jump, jump into a graduate course, you can get honors credit for it, and I'll tell you, I've had several undergraduates take my graduate courses over the last 30 years, and if you're worried about going up against graduate students, don't be, because usually the graduate students, because they're, so, the undergraduate students, because they're so motivated, are at the top of the class, even in those graduate courses. So that's something that you should consider. Those are the most challenging courses you'll take. They're often based on the current literature, and they'll give you an opportunity to be right up on what's going on. Obviously, by having contact with active researchers, you can develop a network. And that network, and I think this is the next one as well, will enable you to know who's important in your field, and more importantly, they'll enable you to get great letters of recommendation. And at a research institution like ours, most departments have some kind of seminar program. And at an institution the size of Texas A&M, we can bring in the best people. I've heard Nobel Prize winners from Stanford, from MIT, come and talk here at Texas A&M. And not only do they talk, but they stick around for a day or two. And they're always interested in meeting undergraduate students. So not only do you get to meet and interact with the faculty here at Texas A&M, but as those faculty bring in their colleagues from other institutions, you have the opportunity to meet those people and to perhaps develop some relationships that will enable you to move over and work with them at their institution if you're planning to go on to graduate school. So there are a number of great opportunities for you at a tier one institution. I went, when I looked at this website today, it's really interesting. These are, these are on a blog, as I say. And there are three comments underneath these, and every one of the comments in response to this list is uniformly negative. One of the comments says, this is absolute rubbish. I went to a tier one university, and all, I, all that happened there was I was taught by graduate students. I didn't have any interaction with the faculty. They were all off in their laboratories doing their research. It was a waste of time. And then another comment from a mother who said just what I said a second ago, I'm paying $20,000 to have my child taught by graduate students. Notice in all of these, the verbs are often you can do something, you could do something, you get a chance to do something. No one is going to hand these opportunities to you. You have to take these opportunities on your own, but you have them at this institution. You have a remarkable ability to get involved in some really impressive work. But you've got to take the initiative. Okay. One point I think I like to raise all the time, but I, I, I think that you might forget is this is not a one-way relationship. You don't come in and work for me, and you are the only person who benefits. I think it's really important to remember that we faculty benefit considerably from having undergraduates work for us. And in fact, my department has about 40 faculty or so, and I don't know anybody in that department who doesn't want undergraduates to come work in their laboratory. Why is that? What are you doing for us? Well, one of the things is you can be one of the most enthusiastic and productive members of the laboratory if you choose to be. And in fact, 
I've had a number of undergraduates work in my lab who've set very good examples for my graduate students. The undergraduates keep to their schedules, they do what they've been asked to do, and they generate very useful results that sometimes actually provide the graduate students with new directions in their projects. So you come in with enthusiasm, you come in with a, as a tireless worker, we all know that you don't need any sleep, so you can basically work all night long. The other thing that you can do for us, which is extremely valuable as well, is I, and we all admit this as scientists, some of us are so engaged in our particular area of expertise that we don't do a very good job communicating to the public the benefits of what we do. Most people think that we only work nine months of the year, and when we're here, we give two, hour, two hours of lecture a week, and then the rest of the time, I don't know what we're doing. We're in the hot tub or something, but essentially, I don't know any faculty member in my department who doesn't put in at least 40 or 50 hours a week. A lot of us stay late, a lot of us come in on weekends, and we do that because we love what we do. But that doesn't get communicated to the public. We need you working for us as missionaries from Texas A&M to convince individuals that there's a lot of good work going on here. I tell you, when you're in an undergraduate research program, you need to talk about your research constantly. You need to tell your roommate, you need to tell your grandmother what you're doing. When you're going up the elevator, the famous elevator speech, tell the person in the elevator what you're doing. Communicate the benefits of your research. Communicate the passion that you see in the research group that you're working with, the thrill of discovery. The undergraduates in my lab are great at that. I meet undergraduate parents all the time, and the comment is always kind of like, well, she's told me about what she's doing in your lab, and I don't really understand it, but boy, it sounds like she's learning a lot. Great, and secondly, she's having a lot of fun. And that's what we need to communicate about research at Texas A&M to the general public, and you as undergraduates, you can do that, right? The other thing I put up here is part of a speech from Gerhard Kasper. Gerhard Kasper was the president of Stanford University, and back in the late 90s, he gave a talk at Beijing University, the 100th anniversary of Beijing University. And the context for this is that the president of Stanford University apparently constantly gets asked, how did you establish such a great relationship with Silicon Valley? How has Stanford University managed to make so many connections and, understood, make so much money off of the development of computers at Silicon Valley? And the response that Casper gave, which led to this speech, is basically it was never intentional. There was no committee that met in 1945 saying, okay, at Stanford, our strategic plan is to develop the computer and then clone a bunch of computer companies in Palo Alto and extract money from them. That was never the plan. But there were committees at Stanford in those days who said, our plan is to pursue excellence, bring in the best people, make them happy, and turn them loose to do the best research that they can. Those people came in, just so happens their electrical engineering department contained some people like Hewlett and Packard who went on to find a garage and build a computer, and because of their loyalty to Stanford University, because of what Stanford University had enabled them to do, the freedom that they got to pursue their interest, and this goes all the way through the founders of Google, who also were researchers at Stanford, they appreciated what Stanford did, they wanted to live in the community, and they wanted to establish connections with Stanford. So the power that Stanford has gained from its connections with Silicon Valley have come from simply fostering the best possible research excellence that they could on campus. So what I really liked about this speech from Casper is he understood the fact that research is a two-way street. You certainly can benefit by participating in research, but you need to realize that you have a contribution to make. Not only do students profit when taught by scholars who are themselves engaged in creative endeavors, otherwise known as research, scholarship itself is enriched when the younger generation consciously, if naively, questions it. Your job is to ask questions. Knowledge is not a huge monolith. Knowledge is somewhat fragile, and you have a hammer in your hand. You can walk up to that apparent monolith of knowledge, and you can hammer on it, and you just might crack it a little bit. And if you're lucky, that crack might spread, and the entire monolith might come tumbling down. So you have a contribution to make, even if it's just sitting in a group of people in your area of interest and asking, well, I don't understand why you're actually doing this. Why is this important? Everyone kind of stares at themselves and says, ah, you're right, maybe it isn't. Well, it's never that simple. But 
you have an opportunity to, by providing a fresh perspective to a project, make a significant contribution. And that's another thing we count on the undergraduates in our program to do, is give us that fresh perspective and think about new directions that we can go in. The second part here, a little bit longer, the most successful method of knowledge technology transfer on the part of universities lies in educating first-rate students who themselves have been engaged in the search to know. Men and women who will then be in a position to take on leadership roles in industry and business. Students who receive their training in university-based research arguably have a greater influence on the economy than the patentable inventions of university scientists. The students who go out there and do great things are better than us. And here's one of my favorite parts. Therefore, attracting gifted students and interacting with them in a non-hierarchical manner, one-to-one, face-to-face, is a crucial condition of success. Again, that is an appeal for working with students in creative, the, the, genera the creative generation of new knowledge, that is, getting students involved in research. And he argues that this is one of the most fundamentally important things that an institution can do. I think most people would argue Stanford's been fairly successful. All right, so where does that leave you? Every year, the National Association of Colleges and Employers does something called the NACE survey, Job Outlook survey. And they ask, 